to hasten the reappearance of our 12th Imam, Imam Al Mahdi, Ajalallah Ta'ala, Farajah Sharif. Please recite Allah Salawat Ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا أبا عبد الله يا غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء يا عشان يا مسلوب العمامة والرداء إمام المهدي عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف in Ziyarat al nahyan where he graphically describes the events of Ashura and the pain and the agony in which Imam al Hussein, Salamullah alayhi and his holy household went through on that horrific day. He says, As-salamu ala shayb al khadib Peace be upon the gray hair that was dyed with blood. As-salamu ala al ghadd al Peace be upon the cheek that struck the dust. As-salamu ala al-thaghr al-maqru' bil-qadib. Peace be upon the front teeth that were beaten with a rod. As-salamu ala al-ra'as al-marfu' Peace be upon the head that was raised upon a lance. As-salamu ala al-Husayn. Everyone together. Wa ala Ali ibn al-Husayn. Wa ala awlaad al-Husayn. Wa ala أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوات على محمد وآل محمد. الله سبحانه وتعالى says in the Holy Quran in verse number one hundred and ten in سورة آل عمران بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر You are the best of nations As an example for mankind You enjoin good and forbid what is evil Yesterday we spoke about self-development and social change And we said that social change is a responsibility, is a duty upon each and every one of us. It is a wajib, it is something we are all required to perform. Now, to, in order to perform this social change, there are a number of steps that one has to take. There are a number of things one has to do. And the most important thing and the first step is to perform Amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar to enjoin good and forbid evil. So inshallah, our discussion tonight will focus around Amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar 
and will revolve around a number of points. The first is the right of the individual and society in the responsibility regarding Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi anil Munka. It might be said, and you might hear this a lot, that forbidding evil, Munkar, is somewhat, is a type of control over others. And this control and this restriction goes against the free will, against the freedom of a person. This freedom each and every one of us has. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this will, this irada we spoke about as well yesterday. So every individual has his freedom, has their freedom, which is his right, whether it's legally through the laws and regulations in a country or in a society, or whether it's through the laws of the fiqh, and where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the individual freedom in certain things. And if we go to the Holy Quran, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La ikraha fid deen. There is no compulsion in the religion of Islam. So with all that said, if this is the case, then I have the right to be free, to live free, to do whatever I want, to do any act I want, regardless, good, bad, uh, haram, halal, no, this, it's up to me. So why do we then stop people from doing certain acts in which we call munka, evil, and tell them to perform certain acts in which we call ma'roof, good. In other words, why do we give to ourselves the jurisdiction and control over people when everyone has the right to choose what path he wants to take, what road he wants to take? So this is one of the main misconceptions that people use and talk about all the time regarding Amr al-Ma'roof and Nahi an al munkar Now we can reply to this by saying the following, that this person we are very so limiting when we are performing Amr al-Ma'roof and Nahi al munkar it's actually from his right, from his haq upon each and every one of us to enjoin good and forbid evil towards that individual. So forbidding evil and enjoining good is from his right, let alone from the right of those performing Amr al-Ma'roof and Nahi al-Munkar. Why? The human being was created in this life, in this dunya, and made to exist in this life, in this dunya, to create for himself or herself a decent life to live in all its aspects. And the Holy Quran says in various verses, one of the verses, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, huwa alladhi ja'ala lakum al-arda dhalula. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who created for you the lands. Wa kulu min rizqih, eat from the rizq, the, the blessings in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you. In another verse, wa laqad karramna bani Adam, we honored the sons of Adam. Wa razaqnahum min al-tayyibat, and we blessed them with goods. So if you look at these verses very carefully and analyze them, we see that man was created and honored, meaning he was given all the tools and all the resources he needs in order to live, to build for himself or for herself a decent life. To build a community, to build a society, to build a civilization. So the human being was created to build a life and this life has different pictures and different representations. The first representation is the materialistic representation of this life we live in, this dunya. And this materialistic representation is in maintaining your existence, your wujud in this life you live in staying alive, being able to provide for yourself, for your family, existing, living a decent life when it comes in terms of your, the materialistic aspect, not depending on anyone. This is the first representation. The second representation is the social representation, and we spoke about this yesterday as well. It is important for us to build that social life of ours, 
It is important to connect with others. It is important to connect with people. It is important to make friends. It is important to connect with our relatives, our family members, to perform Salat Rahim, to connect with our relatives. The third representation is the spiritual. That spiritual life, that spiritual aspect in which, in which each and every one of us has to work on. And this is our bottom. It is the inside. It is the heart. It is the soul. It is taking care of our nafis, making sure that our nafis is spiritually satisfied. Making sure that our nafis is content, making sure that our nafis is happy, making sure our nafis is able to live in peace, this bottom, the inside. So with that being said, one has to preserve this spiritual representation. And for one to preserve this spiritual life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةً يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَلْ الْمُنْكَرِ Let there be arising from you a nation that enjoins good and forbids evil. Those are the successful. That nation is the successful. So the human being was created to build a life in all these different representations. The materialistic, the social, and the spiritual. So if a person rejects this life rejects these representations. Is it from his right to do so? Is it from his haq to do so or not? Of course it's not. If a person decides not to live this life, I don't want to live this life anymore. If a person, God forbid, decides to commit suicide, is it from his right to do so and to annihilate his fortune from this world, from this dunya? No, it is not. In fact, it is his right upon us to stop him, to help him, to guide him, to support him in not doing so. To give another example, let's say a country or a society. This country says, you know what? I don't want no economy. I don't want no health care, I don't want no education, no electricity. Does this mean that this country is free? That we live in freedom, that we did what we want? No, it's from the right of the people living in that community or living in that country to have the basic necessities in life. The same thing here, it's very similar that if a person is committing sin, if a person is performing a ma'asiyah, it is his right upon us to stop him from doing so. Especially when that person becomes a danger on the community and on society, when he's affecting others, when he's affecting his neighbors, when he's affecting his family members, when he's affecting society, those around him. We need to stop him, we need to guide him, we need to help him. صلوا على محمد وآل محمد So with that being said, brothers and sisters, we see that performing al-ma'ruf and al-munkar is a right for both. For the one doing the munkar, it is his right upon us to stop him, and it is our right as well to live in a society, to live in a community where there is no munkar, where there is no sin, where everyone lives in a, lives in a way where they see closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the narrations and in the ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt sallallahu wa sallamu alayhim, they speak about the importance of Amr al-Ma'ruf and Na'a al-Munkar in this sense. In one narration, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam says, Verily the enjoyment of good and the prohibition of wrong is the path of the Holy Prophets, the way of the righteous. The way of the righteous, the righteous ones are those who perform our ma'roof and nahi al-munkar. In another narration, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, you should be enjoining with the good and should be forbidding from evil. Or else, pay attention to this line, or else your evil ones will become office bearers upon you. 
then your good ones will be supplicating, but it would not be answered for them. So I can't just sit at home and pray to Allah, Ya Allah, hopefully this, this person performing sin doesn't come near me or near my children doesn't affect me. Just sit and perform a dua and think that's enough. No, I have a responsibility to speak to that person. Especially if he's going to affect me. Especially if, it is, if he's going to affect those around me, my children, my community members, my neighbors, my family. I have to stand up and I have to speak to him. And I have to guide him and I have to tell him what he is doing is wrong. So this is the first point regarding Amr al-Ma'roof and Naya al munkar The second point is that there is an interrelation between faith and the responsibility of performing Amr al-Ma'roof and Naya al munkar And we spoke about this yesterday very briefly. And where we said a lot of people live this individualistic lifestyle where all they care about is themselves. I am doing well, my religion's on point, my prayer's on point, my salat's on point, my, uh, I attend the mosque, everything, alhamdulillah, I'm good. I have faith, I have iman, and that's good enough. Those around me, my neighbors, who cares? It's okay. As long as I have faith, that's enough. And subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, you, you created all of us in this, in this dunya for you to be the only one that has faith and that's enough that's the goal and this of course is unacceptable this is wrong this is called being selfish if that was the case that Imam Salamullah alayhi and the Holy Prophet we said the Holy Prophet is the most perfect of creations the Holy Prophet could have just sat home not did his mission never tried to guide the people never put himself in harm and the people attacked him and spoke about him. He would have just sat home. Alhamdulillah. I'm, uh, this is the, the closest level any of us can reach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then I should just stay home. Imam Hussein, he should have done that. No, that's not what Imam Hussein salamullah alayhi did. Because Amr bil ma'roof and nahi al munkar is an obligation on each and every one of us. This faith that I have, we spoke yesterday about the characteristic of ida'a. This illumination, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me that knowledge, the light of knowledge, the nur of knowledge, the nur of education, I need to give it to others as well. I need to illuminate others' hearts with it. Same thing here. So, if we go to the Holy Quran as well, we mentioned yesterday in Surah Al-Asr, Al-Asr al-insan fi khusr illa aman wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haq. We said tawasaw mean advise each other advise each other to truth and advise each other to have patience so faith is interrelated with the social aspect regardless what one tries to say now one time I, uh, I read this article this, and this person was writing speaking against Amr ibn Ma'roof and Na'am Munkar and saying he started to bring uh, verses from the Quran and he tried to, to and he tried to say that each and every one of us is responsible for himself and the Quran says that. And one of the verses he brought was this Bismillah Rahman Rahim Alaikum and Fusakum La Yadurukum Manvalla Idhtadaitum. O you who have believed upon you is responsibility for yourself. Now unfortunately, a lot of people who haven't studied the Quran, who don't know the uh, the Arabic language, the Arabic literature, the context in which this verse is, they might not understand the, the proper translation of this verse. So this person, he didn't understand what the tafsir of this verse is. The verse, this verse, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, alaykum and fusakum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala implies that the punishment of the iqab on the day of judgment is only according to the action of each individual. Meaning, if this person performs salat, if this person performs zakat, if, the, if this person uh, fasts, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward him for his actions, not for my actions. He's not going to give me my, he's not going to give him from my hasanat and he's not going to give me from his hasanat. It doesn't work that way. This has nothing to do with not having a responsibility towards one another. 
So with that being said, brothers and sisters, we all have a responsibility of enjoining good and forbidding evil. The same way we like to be guided, we like to be helped, we like people to, to lead us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to show us our flaws, the same way we should be towards others. That's why the Holy Prophet says, a servant will not have faith until he loves for others what he loves for himself. This is the way in which we should be. The third point regarding Amr al Ma'roof and Na' al Munkar is the importance of planning when it comes to Amr al Ma'roof and Na' al Munkar. In the end, Amr al Ma'roof and Na' al Munkar is a treatment, is a medical cure, if you want to say. So, well, for that reason, we need to have a proper plan. We need to know the necessary steps to give this sick person because this person who is performing munkar, he is sick. We need to help him. We need to take care of him. We need to give him this cure. We need to have a proper plan. We need to know what to do. We need to know what are the steps we have to take with that individual so we can help him, so we can take him from this sin and help him reach that pinnacle of obedience and ubudiyah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with that being said, brothers and sisters, there are a number of things we need to know and we need to be aware of before performing Amr al-Ma'roof and Nahi an al-Munkar. Now the first step is to study this sickness in which this individual has. Why is he sick? Why does he do this munkar? What's the motives behind him doing this munkar? Is it his friends? Is it his family members? Is it his neighbor? Is it the community he's in? Why is he doing that munkar? This is the first question, the first step. The second step is to search for the appropriate and successful and effective ways to help that person. What, sh what approach should I take with this person? How should I talk to him? And what tone should I talk to him? When should I talk to him? I need to put a plan. The third step is to refer that person to someone else if I am not able to take care of him, if I am not able to help him out. And there's nothing embarrassing about that. If I'm not able to help this person, I still have a duty, I still have an obligation to help this person. How can I help him? By taking him to someone who can actually be of help, of support, who has knowledge in the, who has more knowledge than me in this certain field, in this certain area that has more experience than me. So I cannot run from my responsibility. I still have to help this person by referring him to those who can take care of him. Now with that being said, brothers and sisters, what are some of the ahkam from the fiqhi perspective regarding Amr bin Ma'roof and Naya al-Munkar? First of all, Amr bin Ma'roof and Naya al-Munkar, as our ulama and our fuqaha mention, it is wajib kifai. What does wajib kifai mean? It means it's an obligation upon the community as a whole, as a group. In other words, if someone performs Amr al-Ma'roof and Naya al-Munkar, Fulan performs Amr al-Ma'roof and Naya al-Munkar, then it's not an obligation upon all of us anymore. The same way some of the ahkam we have in fuqh, some of the rulings like performing Salat al-Mayyid. If someone dies, someone has to perform Salat al-Mayyid. Someone has to bury this, uh, this dead person. It is an obligation. It is a wajib kifai upon each and every one of us. If one does it, this wajib, it's not on our shoulders anymore. So with that being said, brothers and sisters, we need to understand that wajib al-kifai is, is a responsibility, is obligatory upon each and every one of us as a whole, as a community. So if someone doesn't take the initiative, I need to take the initiative. And I need to help that individual. It's not like salat, it's not like psalm, if I pray, khalas. No, this is, if this is completely different. Wajib aini is the responsibility on each, uh, each and every one of us as an individual. It's wajib upon each and every one of us to pray, to perform salat, to fast. No one can fast on my behalf. No one can pray on my behalf. So this is the first point. Now, how do we perform Amr al-Ma'roof and Nahi al-Munkar? When does it actually become obligatory upon us? 
And this is very important in order to know how and what are the conditions to perform Amr al-Ma'roof and Nahi an al-Munkar. The first condition, as our fuqaha mentioned in the Risala Amaliyah, in the Book of Laws, the first condition is knowing the Ma'roof and knowing the Munkar. Being able to differentiate between the two, knowing what good is and what evil is. Knowing what the wajib is and knowing what the haram is. If I do not know my, the ahkam myself, then how am I going to give it to others? In aqaid, in philosophy, the ulama, they mention this term. They say, faqidu shay la yu'tih. Meaning that if I do not have this thing, how can I give it to others? If I do not have money, how am I going to help the poor? Same thing here, if I don't have the knowledge necessary, if I don't know the ahkam myself, how am I going to help others? And if someone thinks, you know what, I still need to help without having the appropriate knowledge, I can make things worse, worse sometimes in doing so. So the first condition is actually knowing the ahkam, knowing the good and knowing the bad, knowing the ma'roof and knowing the munkar. And I'm not saying to know the ahkam in depth here, just to have a general understanding. There are some things, there are some ahkam in which we should all know when it comes to prayer, when it comes to fasting, when it, uh, when it comes to uh, khumus, all these certain things. We should know, we should have a general idea regarding. Now the second condition in which our ulama mention is that, is that I need to internally believe that I can have somewhat of an effect over that person. Meaning that before I perform this Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi al Munkar, I need to think, be honest with myself. Am I able to affect this person? Am I able to have an impact on that person? If yes, I go ahead and do it. If not, then it doesn't become an obligation on me. However, I have to be honest. I can't run away. I can't just start making excuses out of fear or because I'm scared this person is not going to talk to me again or um, I'm just scared of that person. He might uh, you know, not be my friend anymore. It doesn't work that way. I have to be honest. Am I going to have an effect? If yes, I go ahead and do it. It is an obligation to do so. Now, the third condition in which the ulama mention as well is for the one performing munkar to be persistent in doing it. You know, sometimes a person slips. He does something. Okay, you saw it once. He never did it again. It's not obligatory upon you to enjoin good and forbid evil here. Or let's say that person, he keeps sinning. But so many people have spoken to him. So many scholars, so many sheikhs, so many uh, individuals have told him what he is doing is wrong. And this person is starting to feel that guilt. Well, it's not an obligation for me to speak to him again. And this is, and if, and if we really look at this, we see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cares about the sanctity, about the value of the human being. Sah, this person is a sinner. Sah, this person disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't you know, want to make this person uh, ashamed in front of society, make everyone look down upon this person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to protect that, that, that sanctity of that person. And inshallah, in the upcoming discussions, we will speak about this, the honor of the human being and the value of the human being in detail. So this is the third condition. The fourth condition is for the munkar, to actually be a munkar. What do I mean by this? Sometimes we see a person doing an act and that act might be haram. However, this person, let's say, has a valid excuse in doing this certain act. For example, in Shah Ramadan, I see a person not fasting. How is he not fasting? Fasting is mandatory. Fasting is wajib. He's doing a haram. But I know that that person has a medical condition. It's actually haram for him to fast. I can't just go and say what well, he's doing is haram. I need to enjoin good and forbid evil and start talking to him. No, it doesn't work that way. It actually has to be a munkar. Another example. 
Let's say there's a difference of opinion when it comes to a certain issue, to a certain topic between the maraja. Marja acts, let's say, allows, uh, the, allows this person, allows us to swim while we are fasting. Marja, why does it allow it? And I tr go to that person and I tell him what you're doing is haram based. On my marja and based on my taqlid, same thing. And knowing that he doesn't follow the same marja as me, same thing. In this case, it's not obligatory to perform amr al-ma'roof and nay al-munkar. The fifth and final condition is that amr al-ma'roof and nay al-munkar will not cause you any harm, will not cause you any darar. That harm, let it be on your soul, on your nafis, or on your property, on your wealth. You know that this person is going to attack you, this person is going to hurt you, this person is actually going to hit you, is going to hurt your family, is going to attack your house, is going to break your car. In this case, in this situation, it's not obligatory if there is dara. Now, one might ask here, if there is dara, if there is harm, then it is not obligatory. How come? Imam Hussein sallallahu wa sallam in Karbala, he knew what he was going to face. He knew what his family was going to go through. He knew that he is going to die and his holy household is going to die. And they, were, they are all going to be martyrs on the sands of Karbala. And yet he went. Why was that? Because the religion of Islam reached a state. The religion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi reached a state where khalas, it was diminished, it was gone. The values, the morals, the principle, the aqaid, the religion was gone. So because of how important the religion of Islam is, the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi, knowing all what was going to happen to him, he still went to Karbala to, perf to enjoy good and forbid evil, to perform Amr bil ma'roof and Nahi an al munkar And that's what he did, and that was the reason behind the movement of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Until Abu Abdullah al Hussein sallallahu wa sallam alayhi was martyred, him and his holy household. Assalamu alayka ya Sayyidi wa ya Mawlaya ya Aba Abdullah al Hussein wa ala al arwah al lati hallat bi finaik. Alayka minni salamu allahi abadam ma baqeet wa baqeya al layl wa al nahar. ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين وعلى أخ الحسين أبا الفضل العباس وعلى عقيلة بني هاشم زينة سلام الله عليها ورحمة الله وبركاته يا الله اللهم أنا نسألك وندعوك بأحب الخلق إليك فاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها ما تركت لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرشته ولا صفما إلا شفيته إلا مريضا إلا وعافيته يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم وفقنا لمراضيك جنبنا معاصيك ارحمنا برحمتك الواسعة يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج والنصر والعافية ونحن في خير منك وعافية يا أرحم الراحمين لا رحمات ندم جميعا for the souls of all our dead ones our respected مراجع علماء let us recite سورة المباركة الفاتحة but before it allow صلوات على محمد وآل محمد